today. I apologize for that. <laughs> anyway, I know that my bio is extensive, but I, I, I think I did that back in 2009 when we first started this project, and I needed to submit something to the Herford Association. Um, I actually copied a, a previous article, and since then I've just been copying and pasting, and I'll let you deal with it. It is pretty large, and that's probably because I'm from Texas, and they like to be humble, right? <laughs> um, so anyway, uh, one of the things, I, I did this presentation before, and <clears throat> if you've seen it, uh, I'm sorry, I have to say it right again. But part of the deal is meeting the challenges, so I'm gonna talk a little bit about who we are at Catalan, and uh, just to give you an idea of what we're bringing to the table in this project. Um, the history of Catalan is companies, and, uh, statement. So Callaway has been around actually since the 1970s. Uh, they did do the poll test station for the longest time under Pat Fisher. He's still on board as our general manager, by the way. Um, and we acquired a second fila in 2010, which is uh, Hiltona Holdings. Uh, that fila is capable of holding about 8,000 head. Um, through the integration of the companies, Creekstone Farms came about in 2004. So we produce about 50% of our barley needs and close to 75, 20% of all of our salvage, everything else we buy locally from producers. So we buy and sell a lot of commodities. Of course, you need trucks to get this back and forth along with the animals. So also in 2004, we established Creekstone Trucking. Um, the National Bull Evaluation Center has been there for the longest time. We do have the capacity of holding up to 5,000 head, but over the past years, that number fluctuates anywhere from 500 to 1,000, depending on how good or bad the years were financially for the producers. The IBRS, which is the research component, has actually been around in Catalan previously. We did a lot of research and 2003, when the current owner, Karen Gregory, took it over, they expanded the research part of, of the hands in the feedlot. And then in 2009, we created its own company and department. And last year, we created our own brand of beef, which is Canadian Platinum Beef. Uh, we needed to try and meet the demands and look at alternatives of how we're going to market. Because, um, you know, over the past two years, between Lakeside closing down and selling and then JBS, sorry, JBS taking over. And then last year with the flood to cargo, it kind of started putting a lot of stress on what do you do when you have cattle that are ready and, and you're limiting your, your markets. Uh, so there's a picture of Catalan. Um, we're located just north of Strathmore, uh, about 10 miles north of Strathmore. Uh, we are what's called a vertically integrated agricultural enterprise because we have our own trucks, our own feed for the most part. Um, we don't own a packing plant, but we do have alliances with the, with the packing plants. Uh, our one-time feeding capacity at Calvin, it's over 30,000 head. So annually, we rotate our turnover to somewhere around 44,000 head of animal. Um, the reliability and consistency of the end product, it's of greater importance because that's one of the challenges that we have as beef producers compared to poultry and pork producers, right? Trying to achieve the same quality on a consistent basis is, is an ongoing challenge. Uh, so we're always looking for ways to improve this, and uh, we do this through uh, various methods. Uh, Eltona Holdings, I talked about that a little bit. We have 30 pants. The entire feedlot is EU certified, so if we needed to, it could be isolated, uh, and also it could be research isolated. So we do use it a lot for large pen studies. Um, and if that's not the case, uh, when we don't have research going on or booked, uh, we open our pens for back to our custom uh, customers. So the vision, um, I'm gonna have to read it because I don't even though I wrote it I don't remember it. <laughs> Um, but essentially what we're trying to do is we're trying to be as neutral and unbiased as possible because we do a lot of work for people that compete against each other. So on the research side, you'll have a Lanco coming in, testing whatever, an implant, and then you have Merck coming in, testing the implant that's going to compete against the Lanco. So 
we have to be as professional, biased, and confidential as possible. Everyone in our staff, which is 62 of them, they all sign a confidential agreement and are legally liable if they open up their mouth. So, um, we do try to provide the best services uh, possible. We have three full-time scientists on staff. Christine back there, uh, she just joined our team in mid-December. And uh, Meg Taylor, some of you guys know, he's actually joined us back as the co-manager for research. Uh, the Bull Test Center, we are the largest of its kind, even though we may not have all 5,000 animals who are capable of holding it. Uh, I believe back in the heyday when Pat Fisher was running the show, there were upwards of three to 4,000 we used to offer a sale. And unfortunately, that kind of faded away a little bit. Um, we brought in the technology that uh, Allison and her team provided and produced here in Canada. Part of the reason why I decided to move to Canada because believe it or not, this country is very innovative on all the technology that's for, for the cattle producers. Probably it has to do with the weather, I don't know, but you always have to find new ways to survive and compete with the US and everybody else. So the normal bull test, uh, these are the dates that I would like to see the producers come in, which is from September to October. Now that happens probably about 25% of the time because most of you guys that are our producers and you're also farmers, you're probably in the middle of harvest or something, so typically the bulls will struggle in somewhere between early September to about December. And then of course you want you to have your bulls ready for February and that usually doesn't happen. We do try to get you as much information as possible to help you out with your sales and catalogs and pictures and all that stuff. But uh, normally the regular bull test is 112 days long. We weigh the animals every 28 days. And we do anticipate at the beginning about a 20 day warm up to get the animals uh, uh, associated and accustomed to their bones. And the uh, feed, depending on what you were feeding there. On the net feed efficiency, uh, which is the RFI system. Um, we do have those, we have eight pens, uh, and they are in pretty high demand. One of them is because of the project here with the Herford Association that's been scheduled for the last three years. And there's always ongoing demand for research purposes or other producers that want to test their animals as well. Um, on that one, there's an additional $2.50 uh, per head day cover some of the costs associated with the system, but uh, we do try to accommodate everybody as much as we can, depending on the number of head that you bring. Um, so IBRS, which is their research part of it, um, it's a pretty long statement, but to narrow it down, we're pretty centrally located because we're north of Strathmore. We have access to JBS, we have access to cargo, we can export and send cattle down to the U.S. We have ongoing relationships with the University of Calgary, with the University of Alberta, with universities in the U.S., uh, with, the, with John Becerra and his team at the Macomb Research Station, and also Quantum Genetics, which is based out of Saskatoon. So it's a pretty good central location in the heart of Alberta for companies, whether it's pharmaceutical or whoever it is, uh, a feeds company that wants to come in to Canada. And, uh, we all know that Alberta is the heart for beef production, so it's, it's a really good spot for us. Some of our accomplishments, um, Connie mentioned this already, but just to give an idea, when I came on board, um, we were sort of limited to research that came to us, and we didn't actively seek out to go and get more work. So in the year of 2008, we only had three projects. You can see we had about 1,200 head. So out of our total population uh, in the field, that was only about 5%. A year later, Meg and I and all the team, along with uh, everybody's help there, we took that up to 12 studies. So we elevated our research population to 71%. Uh, we maintained that in 2010. Uh, it looks like we actually went down in the population, but you gotta remember that's when we took over a second feedlot, so our overall population increased. Uh, 
And then in 2011, 2012, we went down in the number of projects, but we did much larger project, projects. We're talking anywhere from 12 to 17,000 head and one exclusive trial for, um, for sponsors. So we've been maintaining that as much as we can. Um, 2012, 2013 was a bit of a rough year for us because uh, we lost our cattle manager. Unfortunately, he passed away. And uh, we had to restructure our, our internal assignments of duties. So I went from just a research manager to the overall cattle manager and research manager and whole test manager. And then I lost my assistant manager because he got promoted to become the cow herd manager. He couldn't help anymore because he went from 400 head to 6,000 head. So he was pretty busy. Uh, so we struggled a lot. And I know that all college and John put up with a lot of crap for me and not answering emails on time and things like that. But that we're, we're kind of back on track. <laughs> um, so residual feed intake, I'm not going to spend a whole lot of time on this because the expert is here, so you can ask John and pick his brain, but I'll give you the, the Cowboys terminology uh, from our itself. So essentially what it is is the difference between what you expect an animal is going to eat and what it actually ate. If it eats less, it has a negative RFI value, and if it eats more, it has a positive value. I did do a lot of this work under uh, Dr. Carson's back in Texas A&M and um, oddly enough I thought that this technology had to come from Texas right because we're the gods and everything and then come to find out it's actually a Canadian thing and I, I was just couldn't believe it. But, uh, anyway that's the part of the formula I can't explain it to you. Um, it, it looks very complicated. John assures me that it's not but I'm not a statistician, so I, I can't even decipher it. Uh, again, like I said, those that eat less will have a negative RFI. Those that eat more will have a positive RFI. I'll give you a bit of an example of some of the work that I did do at Texas A&M and other Dr. Carson's. And here's just a comparison so you start understanding what's happening. You have two steers that starting pretty much they have the same identical body weight. You can see left and right, it's, not, it's only about a three pound difference. The average daily gain is also pretty much the same, 2.11, 2.16. And this is what you're expecting the animals to consume, 1,500 pounds or so. Okay. As the study went along over 77 days, which is what typically what we need for actual data in these bins, um, the actual feed intake difference is the steer on the left ate 1,717 pounds, and the steer on the right only ate 1,232 pounds. So that's a pretty significant difference. Um, when it comes to the residual feed intake, you see your RFI values right there. Obviously, the one on the left ate a lot more, so it has a positive RFI. The one on the right ate a lot less, has a negative RFI. Um, the difference between the two is 485 pounds. So when you translate this to dollars over the lifetime of an animal, that's what makes a big, big difference. Um, so just to give you a synoptic of it, or how important RFI is for the produce pool. Uh, the gross aid system at Cattleman, uh, like I mentioned, we have eight pens. Each one of the pens has five nodes. Two of our pens actually have removable panels, so that if we needed to create a larger type portion uh, of the study, we can do so. They all have shared waters. Um, our systems, uh, they are fairly but so you have if you're coming to us you got to look at a one to two years ahead of schedule sometimes um, we may have an opening because either a grant or something doesn't go through and all of a sudden two pits open we just helped out a producer over a week's time where he had a, a need to play 70 animals and uh, we had a cancellation from one of our pilot pilot projects so it just kind of worked out perfect he, he came in there and, it was a win-win situation for both of us. Um, for the grow safe test, we normally go with 100 days. This is typically what we used to do. Uh, the reason for it, you're looking at 77 days of data, so that's, you know, you can just pretty much round it up to 80. Uh, we always wanted anywhere from 15, 15 to 20 days of uh, a warm-up period, and if you allow for five days or so of 
lost power, bad weather, whatever the case may be, uh, you, you're already up to 100 days. Um, a $2.50 head a day, it kind of starts adding up, so part of what we revamped with the help of John and through all this project is the fact that we realize that the warm-up does not need to happen in these pans. So as long as I have, now the challenge for me as the feedlot manager is that I have to tie up other pens on the commercial side to warm up the animals before they move to the grow safe side. Uh, and we need to have those flexibilities on the pens so when we're overbooked, uh, now we're almost kind of operating like an airline and we sell too, the pens too much on pens. It does create a challenge. Um, part of this project is that it didn't matter if, if I had the grow safe pens, the producers are getting the benefit because it is a fixed cost. So if you came in and you were able to go in there right away, we put you in there. Otherwise, we do warm up the animal somewhere else and then move you into the grocery. Uh, so these are the prices based on costs from 2011. And for the Herford Association, this entire project, what Callahan agreed back when we pitched this uh, to John, and with the help of John, is we help reduce all the costs and we agreed to do this and maintain the same cost for the length of the, uh, the study. Um, we, we went and these are normally, if I was to charge full prices to everybody, this is what it would cost. And I think a lot of times this is what drives some of the producers away because if you came in and if you could see, um, by the time, based on a 20 head minimum, because I would like to have at least 20 animals in my pens in order to just break even on the headaches that you have to go through and, and the maintenance and um, all the other things you have to do. They're not, uh, I'm not saying they're difficult to maintain, but they definitely do require a little bit more attention because you do have to feed up to two, three times a day. And if you only have five animals in there, the cost benefit compared to something else it doesn't add up. Um, the yardage uh, based on 20 head uh, is 56 cents. Uh, this is all in, all in, so we have to do the ultrasound, the BSE, which is the, um, the semen evaluation. Uh, the worst case scenario for bedding, for feeding, for health, all the way days. Uh, at the end of the day, where you're looking over 20 head, it's $588 for the test period. So you're looking at $600 a head to, to come in there. And like I said, this is worst case scenario. If you don't want to do the semen exams, that takes, it gets taken out. If, if we're not capable of doing the ultrasound because of the age or you don't want to pay for it, that gets taken out. And then uh, John and his team adjust the calculations based on that. Um, we took the worst case scenario on betting and actually uh, probably got to reevaluate that because this past winter was probably the worst winter I've experienced since I've been here. So all in all, um, it's, it's rather costly, and especially when you don't know what the results are going to be. So it's a scary way to try and go in and just to find out what your animals are going to do. Then comes the results, which uh, uh, the best way I can explain to you in any one given test, because they're isolated, you can't compare them to the others, um, there's a potential that 50% of your animals are not gonna be good, right? Uh, and it doesn't necessarily mean that they're bad overall. It's just that for this particular aspect, that's just the way the distribution works out. If you didn't want to do the growth safe and you just do a regular performance test, you're looking at around $380 per head. So it's a pretty significant difference to try to sell this to producers. But I think that if we went back and you look at the difference on the feed consume of the animal, you took that into account for how much feed you're wasting by feeding inefficient animals, you will probably realize that spending the extra $300 to find out which animals you actually need to keep on your herd or the lifetime of your herd, it's gonna save you probably millions of dollars in feed, and not at least it does for us. Um, one of the things that we do at uh, uh, Catalan is we do try and focus on genomics with the help and, and collaboration of quantum genetics, we've been working on leptin for a while. Uh, there's many other markers and hormones out there that play 
uh, a part on the overall genomics of, of uh, an animal. Uh, this is just one of the ones that we manage probably the best for the past six years. Um, we did have a really good alliance with the Nielsen brothers in Lakeside, and that's where our genetic breed alliance was headed to, and unfortunately when they had to sell the plant, uh, that kind of dissolved, so that's kind of on the hiatus status right now. But anyway, let them spin around probably since we were created, right? I mean, all mammals have it. Uh, it was discovered in a laboratory in New York, I believe, and you can see here the difference. Uh, those are actual mice from the lab, and that's the, the structure of the, uh, the hormone there. It does uh, help regulate the food intake and body weight. Um, and like I said, it was discovered in a mouse colony. There are three variants, CC, CT, and TT. Um, essentially, and uh, this is where I try to explain things to, to make a little bit of sense. Um, the reason, uh, I'm not a sexist guy, but I do use women to compare this because I have to explain this to my wife one day, and she didn't understand how, what the hell I was talking about. And I said, well look, uh, everybody has this, all of us have it. The CCs are the type of women that eat all day long and never gain any weight. The CTs are the ones that are right there in the middle. So typically, if you eat healthy, you look healthy, and if you eat like crap, you get a big butt, right? And then the TTs are the one, the type of women that typically just look at a piece of cake and put on five pounds. Well, I'm trying to explain this back to cattle. I said cattle are the same way. When the cattle come in, and if you're buying cattle based on average groups, and they're all 550 pounds and evenly distributed, and you package looks great because that's what the cattle, the order buyer put together for you, you put them on feed, you come back 150, 200 days later, and they're all over the place, and the guy tells me these are not my cattle, look at all these different weights, but that's because everybody gains weight different. So part of what we try to do here is that we try to manage the genetics that you brought to us. If you wanted to participate on this, and of course it's not free, um, we do charge for these services, is that we will try and segregate the animals, and at that one point we were also using things like Cellmax and Optiflex, and now it looks like the market is taking those away more and more, and, and help you manage when the cattle um, we're ready to go to market at the precise moment, and we could narrow it down to the week, we could anticipate what the yield was going to be, what the grade was going to be, and because of that, we were able to work out better prices with the packing plant. Of course, we got paid better, therefore you got paid better, and your minimal investment could bring you back some substantial rewards. Um, the problem with the challenges that we have You've been going on this on the left and some of the things that it can help on the cow calf side of the house is that it has it, it's been proven that leptin traits help with weaning weight cow milk production the accumulation of back fat um, and overall reproduction because if an animal on our genetic alliance we try to manage this by focusing on the sires and not the dams because that's when you can spread the better amount of uh, the, the chromosomes going around and improve the overall percentage of the herd. But we also tested for RFI at the same time. So we weren't just focusing on one. Um, when you have sires, you have to look at the overall package and what it is that you actually eat in your herd. Um, so some of the benefits, like I said right here, they increase carcass value, they optimize takes of feed. Um, and it can be customized to your operation. We can do this as much or as little as possible. We can try and help you. If we can't do it ourselves, then we'll get you in touch with the people that can do it. And the cow herd, this is, um, and some of these, uh, the, the statistics are correct. When I get to the next one, I believe it's the prices. Uh, those don't no longer apply because like I said, we're kind of stopped that project right now. Uh, but just so you can see there, the difference on millimeters of back fat between your three um, markers there. Uh, at the end of the day, if you look at the bottom and you look at your weaning weights, that's also when you start seeing the differences. But uh, the millimeters of back fat in the fall is what makes a difference. And 
when we used this program on finishing cattle at the Fila, that was part of what we were managing was uh, no use of backpack so that we try to minimize overweights and discounts for the producer. Excuse um, me, can I ask you a question? Sure. Uh, when, you, when you do that millimeters backpack, do you have a relevance or relation to a, a condition score on a cow, like two and a half or three or three and a half of the amount of that backpack? Um, I'm not going to be able to answer that on the cow side of the house because when we did it, it was strictly on finishing cattle. We were looking for specific, uh, at least 10 to 11 millimeters of back fat to determine whether the animal, when it was going to be ready for market. Uh, I can get you in touch with Jen Palmer, which I will probably answer you better. Um, so the price is that uh, when we um, started our alliance, we were trying to explain to our producers how this will benefit. Essentially what we were trying to do at the time was we were providing the sires to all the cow-calf producers that wanted to participate in this or help them acquire their own sires in exchange for the first right of purchase on the calf so that way we, we knew what was coming into the feedlot uh, and we were trying to anticipate and hedge ourselves a little bit better. Like I said, we got paid more, you got paid. You can see some of the differences. Um, what we were saying, the, the bull cost uh, under normal conditions, which is on the left, on the right is the lines. Um, we were providing the sire for sale. Obviously, there was no auction mark commissions. The genotyping was costing you $15, but even with the $15 um, uh, involvement from your part, um, the overall, it, it was still a difference of 51, almost $52 there that you were ahead. This kind of has come to a stop right now, now that we haven't finished it. But the biggest problem is how do we tie all this together and, and how do we can make money out of it? Because really, I think that's what we're all in this for, right? I think maybe except for the PhDs because they've got a secure salary, right? Um, so producers historically, um, have always stuck to their roots. And that's part of what I saw also up in Edmonton, right? We had this other fellow there from North Carolina who was doing a lot of grow safe, feeding everything, but he didn't want to stray away too much from the way that he learned to do things. So every time that you come out with a new technology or you have some type of new innovation, trying to sell it to the producer, trying to sell it to the packer is always a challenge. Um, everybody wants a change, but they don't really want to believe it. Um, and because there hasn't been much of a vertical integration, the cow-calf producer was always looking for himself, after himself. The field operator was on looking for after himself, and, and, the, and the packer was the same way, and we all blame each other, saying, well, the other guy just wants to do this, and we all think that the packer makes the most amount of money, but if you're really involved in the, in the industry, you realize that their margins are very, very small and once the animal is dead you have an expirable commodity that they need to get rid of um, as a feedlot operator you can delay the sale of the animal at least a little bit if you need to but then you get your discounts if you wait too long the cow calf producer didn't really care what he did at home because he wasn't going to carry those animals through he just wanted to get rid of them in the fall and then they became the feedlot's problem so this is one of the biggest challenges we had trying to get people to understand that we were all working together, not against each other. Um, so today's beef use, uses 30% uh, less land, 14% less water, 9% less fossil fuel than 30 years ago. Uh, we're trying to change the way that we think of Catalan. Uh, I am the oldest of the managers for the companies at Catalan. I'm 42. Uh, Christine is our youngest. Uh, 23, 24. Um, so we have a pretty young mindset, and that's what our owners wanted. Uh, the beauty about Karen, our owner, is the fact that she grew up around the industry, but not in the industry. She's actually an accountant uh, by trade. So when financially things don't make sense, and you keep doing it year after year after year, she started questioning all of us as to why do we keep doing this if every year we're in the freaking hole, 
right? And we need to change the way we do things. And, and part of that was bringing in new, new members and, and fresher ideas, I hope. Um, so one of the things uh, at Catalan is that we don't use the A word anymore because of the customer's uh, perception of what liquid health does to the animals. Um, I always try to relate things and, and, and I hope that you do the same because at the end of the day, uh, we're all trying to survive. So when you go to Walmart or whatever it is that you buy or you're talking to somebody, you need to make people understand that these products, these, these new technologies that we have, they're not harmful and it's actually what helps us all survive. Um, I, I do a lot of other type of uh, speaking arrangements in the city of Calgary and I usually have a pretty diverse crowd in there and one of the things I explain to people is that you have children and most people do uh, and you tell them well do you vaccinate them when they're young or do you just hope they survive on their own? Right? And all of a sudden things kind of hit home and say, well, no, we vaccinate them. We don't want them to get polio. We don't want them to get the measles. We don't want them to do this, do that. So, well, that's the same thing with the cattle. These calves that come into the feed lab, they're like my children. So why would I punish them just because you think I'm doing a bad job? I don't, you're a lawyer. I don't tell you how just because I watch CSI or Law and Order. I don't go and tell you what you need to be doing in your business. Um, so therefore, you kind of have to argue, but in a very political way, and make it understand that what we are doing is actually a positive improvement. When they understand that, by us needing less land, that means you can have a better, bigger house out in the suburbs of Calgary or wherever it is that you live, because you keep pushing us out. Um, people under, you know, Carolina's got, I mean, sorry, Canada's got a lot of land, and they say, well, why can't you just let them go out there and roam free? And say, well, all die. Um, so vertical coordination, not integration, is what we're looking for. We don't want to own everything. Uh, we're good at what we do on the feed lots out of the house, and we're about 60% efficient on the cow calf side of the house. Uh, we don't need to own the packing plant to bring all this together. We just need to have the right alliances, and that's what we're looking at doing. So. We like to use coordination, not integration. Um, like I said, selling the future is always a hard um, pill to swallow, uh, especially right now. You got commercials from PNW, right, that is telling everybody hormone free, or actually, sorry, let me say this is no hormone added because the general public does not understand that everything has hormones. Um, just so you know, my wife is not stupid, but she is ignorant about certain things because she is a, uh, a biologist, but she doesn't understand the agricultural industry. One day we're shopping and uh, we need eggs, so she goes and grabs, grabs the omega-3 package eggs. I said, well, no, 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 get, get the cheaper ones, right, because I want to save money. She goes, but these are better for you. I said, how do you know they're better for you? I said, well, look at them. They're packaged much nicer and they cost more money, so they must be better for you. And the last farm, uh, egg farm tour that I took, I went in there, and the manager tells me, here we produce 21 different kinds of eggs. I say, how the hell is that even possible? He goes, well, we have three sizes, medium, large, and junk. And we have seven different customers, so depending on who we're packaging for, um, there's 21 different kinds of eggs. So the same eggs that go to Sobeys under the brown cheap cartons, and the same eggs that go to Sobeys under the Omega-3 extended package or whatever, just because they were all fed a little bit more flaxseed, and they don't determine as to which chicken lay what egg, because they all get the same diet. Uh, it's all a marketing thing. So this is what you have to deal with on reality with the producers right there. So if you're not involved with blogs and social media, you don't need to, but if you are, I hope that you're helping the agricultural industry and letting people know that what we're doing is a good thing, not a bad thing. Um, and don't be shy to tell them that without us, um, you wouldn't survive, because that's just the bottom line. Um, questions are more powerful than data. This is from Dr. Caper at Montana State University. One of the, uh, uh, and I'll show you here the, the news article. Somebody asked, could rectopamine added to the food supply in 97 with little public awareness be contributing to skyrocketing 
rates of obesity and hyperactivity in children. They're not saying this is a cost, they're just putting the question out there. So now the producer and, and these particular blogs are reading these things from Dr. Oz or Helen or whatever hell they're reading. Now they start wondering, ractopamine, I heard about that. So it's gotta be bad, this is what's doing that. Maybe the question should have been, does the fact that everybody works more hours and your children spend 90% of the time playing video games and eating crap in front of the TV, maybe that's what's making them fat, not rectopamine. <laughs> but nobody wants to say that, right? Because we're politically incorrect. Um, so nine reasons to fear your steak there. I mean, I, uh, I always, uh, every once in a while, I put a thing on, on my Facebook and on the Catalan things and say, if you're a friend of mine today, you will eat a steak. And, uh, and I get a lot of replies back. Uh, friends are saying, you know what, the steak does sound damn good because nobody gets together for a barbecue and, and, and says, you know what, Will makes the best asparagus I've ever tasted in my life. Everybody wants your either steak recipe or ribs or whatever it is, so it's a comfort food and we need to eat more of it and learn how to cook it. I think that's the other challenge because everything's just now ready products, right? Um, Canadian Platinum Beef, this is our brand, and I just took this from our website because I couldn't actually download uh, the, the pictures. But if you notice there is that we offer halal slaughter, dopamine free beef, and natural beef products. One of the things that we didn't want to do is just isolate and become just all natural or whatever. Um, one of the things that I didn't tell you is that out of the 4, 44,000 animals that we feed annually, 9,000 of them are on a natural product, on a natural program, I should say. Uh, that means they are liquid health free, they are um, beta agonist free, no ionophores in the feed, everything that you can think of that the producer might think is bad for them. The reality is that out of those 9,000, only about 2,200 make it to market annually, so you have to carry these animals over and over again. That means that we are slaughtering only 5% of our population for a market that the, that the public thinks it's what's driving the demand, and that's not what's driving the demand. The reason we offer halal uh, slaughter beef is because one of our markets is in Dubai. So because of religious re uh, reason, we have to produce that. Um, and you notice, um, we also mentioned rectopamine free is because we're going into particular countries where they ban rectopamine, not because it's bad, because those particular uh, countries like Russia feels that they can't compete with the US if you're bringing in rectopamine fed cattle because they don't have the technology or they have approved or understand how the technology works, so they don't want to use it, so therefore they don't want to buy your beef if it's been fed. We also sell a lot of beef, well not a lot, we just started selling beef to Vietnam. Uh, in Vietnam, they don't care what the hell you fed to it, they just want it. Uh, they're hungry, they want it, they're starting to make more money and they want to eat better protein besides chicken and duck eggs. Um, so our genomics is our past and our future. Uh, you can't get away from it. It's been there for a long time. We just need to understand it and manage it better. Um, I had to give credits to a whole lot of people, and if you can read real quick, some are there, and a lot of others are not. <laughs> I apologize if I left anybody out. Um, and at this time, if you have any questions, I'll go ahead and answer them. The two steers that you had with the positive and the negative up on the left? Yeah. Did you slaughter them, and can you tell me what the yield grade was on? I will have to go back. This was conducted probably about Long time. 13, 15 years ago, back so at the a and Research rough, rough shot on it? No, I have no clue. Yeah. yeah. We, can, we can partially answer that. Um, like, we've taken those cattle, and we've slaughtered, taken right through the slaughter, uh, well over 2,000 head. So the question you're asking is, is there a relationship between this feed efficiency trait, residual feed intake, and carcass traits? And the answer is, for the most part, no. So there's the relationship, there's a very small relationship between 
RFI, negative RFI, and being a bit leaner. Very small, but a, very, a bit leaner. When we looked at the yield and quality grades, so that's how you're getting paid, we saw no difference. There was no difference in those 2,000 head. So the effect on carcass traits is very small. somebody, one of our customers, they, they hold about 9,000, well, anywhere from 7 to 9,000 head at all times there at the FILA. What these people did is that they created their market, their market endpoint first, and then worked backwards as to what they were going to sell. So the premiums that they capture pay and, and they get supported every which way, all the way back through. This particular company carries the animals from birth all the way to the plate, um, but it is market dictated. Um, we have a, another company from British Columbia that's coming in tomorrow, and, and they are a pharmaceutical company uh, that has a, a natural product, and they want to create their own brand. Everybody wants to create their own brand because they think they're going to make a ton of money. I'm telling you, we slaughter on average maybe 40 head a week for this. I am for free. Um, on the other, to buy, everything's market driven. So the problem is that you need to be able to capture those premiums. Don't think by any means that you can make the product and there's a demand for it out there. If you don't know how to carry it all the way through, you're just going to be sitting on very expensive, regular meat. Um, and that's all there is. And by the time, if you sell it on a regular contract or a futures or the cash market, and it's going to Cargill or JBS or whoever, they don't care what you did with it because it's going to enter the regular market. So unless you align yourself with Spring Creek beef or um, whoever it is, or if you do create your own and, and you sell to your local market, um, you, you better capture that premium somehow. One of the other reasons we're able to not feed rumensin is because we don't push the cattle as long. Uh, if you notice, there's 9,000 head on the field at any one given time, only 2,200 of them are actually going to market. So some of these animals come into the field and they have um, two birth dates there before they're ever slaughtered. So you better be prepared to pay that feed bill over the better part of 34 months. It's not a cheap thing. So um, if you can take advantage of ionophores and implants and beta agonists and RFI and leptin and everything else, why will you do it? We're not the European Union. Nobody, nobody's saying that you can't use these products. Um, there is a market for them, but it's a very small market. Yes. Do you see the market expanding with the uh, A&W Better Beef program now? No, I see the market. I think it's a bit of a fade. Um, you know, like in, in the past, um, uh, antibiotics was a bad word, right? And that's kind of fading away. We're just calling it liquid health just for the heck of it, to be honest, at the Catalan. Um, I do a lot of tours of Catalan. People don't know the difference between a steer and a heifer. Um, they're all cows to them, right? Um, they want to know where the, where the babies are, and this and that. And, uh, so I think eventually the hormone-free, unless legislatively uh, it comes down and, and we are prohibited from using implants and things like that, I don't see it changing. I, I do perhaps see an increase in, in the demand for specific products, but normally that's about 10% of your most wealthy population that are willing to pay that. Right? I mean, if you're going to the supermarket and you, there's a 
all natural steak for $17 a piece and a regular steak for $7 a piece and identically they're the same. If you're on a tight budget filling, you know, feeding a family of six or whatever, you're gonna have to think twice, right? Yes, John. Uh, just, just a comment for William to compliment what you said is that um, we often forget about the environmental impact of these types of long feeding systems that William has talked about with, with some of these specialty products. The carbon footprint and the environmental footprint of long feeding cattle, cattle that have two birthdays, could double. <laughs> so, you know, while you're advertising that uh, this beef product has, um, is, is hormone free or um, is ractopamine free or technology free, you should also say, um, the carbon footprint has doubled. The environmental impact has doubled. You saw all those great figures that William showed right off the bat that showed over 30 years technology has reduced land use, water use, etc., by 30 some percent in some many cases. Well, you're going backwards. Okay? So, just a comment. The cattle that were going over to uh, Dubai, mm -hmm. that haul all kill? Yes. Were they, do all haul all kill after? Um, in Dubai and Abu Dhabi on a secure No, office. no, they were dumped 13,000 twice a week off them ships from Australia. Yeah. And they were all, all killed. No, no, they, they do not need to meet those requirements. We just offer it. Um, like I said, we then want to just focus on our brand to be natural or rectopamine free only. And, and, uh, and it's funny because a lot of these other countries know about rectopamine, but they don't know about Zepatero. But I guess it doesn't matter now because pull it off the shelf anyway. Um, but no, they do not. I mean, all they really care is about how the cattle were slaughtered, right? Yes. I wanted to ask a question about your genotyping cost of $15. Uh, how, many, how many samples would have to be genotyped in order to obtain that kind of price? If your that price was offered to our alliance members,